have you guys joining us. We have an awesome slate of panelists today, and we're going to spend most of the time in Q&A with you guys. But just to kick it off, we'll share a little bit about what each of these wonderful organizations and their representatives here today are working on, and we'll show you some previews of really cool stuff to come on the Roblox platform. So to my right, we have Christine Reek from Museum of Science Boston. We have Dan White from Filament Games. And then we have David Greer from Project Lead the Way. So just to kick off very briefly, Roblox, for anyone who doesn't know, is a platform that brings millions of people together through playful experiences, metaverse um, experiences, could be digital learning experiences, could be gaming experiences, art experiences, music experiences. And our education focus at Roblox is really looking to bring high quality educational experiences that can be used in school and at home to the platform. So we have a program called the Roblox Community Fund that makes grants to fantastic organizations who help to bring that content to life. And that's what brings us here today. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to whoever's first up in our slides, if you guys don't mind advancing to the next one. Uh, one more, thank you. Sorry, these are all still Roblox. Keep going. Perfect. All right, one more, sorry. Great, all right, we'll start off, I think um, Filament, you might be first up. Okay, this is not the ideal It's all of them, but yeah, keep going. If you guys I'm don't mind, Donna one Hughes. more. Sorry, oh, this just is a little casual. Myself. Well, maybe Christine's first up. Sorry, oh, Christine, you're okay. first up. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, changing it up on us. I got so excited. And I'm gonna sorry, steal Dan. Dan's idea of yeah. um, standing here Perfect. so that I can see the slides and um, See all of you. So I'm Christine Reach. I'm the Chief Learning Officer at the Museum of Science in Boston, and we are so excited because we are working on a Destination Mars Roblox game. So um, Museum of Science is um, a museum in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, we are located on the Charles River, and um, there's a spot in the museum where you can actually have one foot in Boston and one foot in Cambridge. Um, and so we are split right there in the middle. Um, but really, where we're located is everywhere. Um, we serve over a million visitors each year on our site, but we serve even more than that through our National Engineering is Elementary curriculum, which is in schools across the country and around the world, as well as through traveling exhibitions that we develop that are traveling around the world. We have one in Japan right now. Um, and also through planetarium shows, um, which we license to planetariums around the world, and um, including one in Azerbaijan at the moment. Um, so we are really located everywhere, and one of the other ways that we want to be located everywhere is not just by being kind of in museums and in schools, but also being present online. And our hope is that by 2030, we will be reaching over 100 million people online, and Roblox is one of the gateways to get there. So the question, of course, is why would we want to reach 100 million people? Um, and it's because we want people to be more like those of you who are part of um, the first organization, which is that we want everyone to have a lifelong love of science. And we think that if everyone has a lifelong love of science, we'll create a world um, where science belongs to each of us for the good of all of us. Better decision making, more innovation, um, really working to advance um, all of the aims that we seek to achieve. So um, one of the specialties of the Museum of Science is engaging visitors in engineering design activities. This is one of our most recent exhibitions where we engage visitors in the engineering design process. They get to program hedgehog robots, um, develop physical objects that they then launch into a digital um, splash tank to see how they float. Um, and the idea is just that we want people to have a goal and iterate towards that goal just like all of you do. Um, we do engineering education not just in the museum, but also in the classroom um, through our engineering is elementary curriculum. And so we've developed a specialty in thinking about engineering, learning in a variety of contexts, and we're so excited to think about how we can bring it to an online environment. But in addition to focusing in on engineering, we're also really good at immersion when we're in the place of the Museum of Science. So our planetarium shows can transport you. Um, one that we have is Destination Mars. It really does feel like you're transported to Mars. Um, if you can advance to the next slide. Um, but this requires that you come into the museum to feel like you are on a Martian habitat. And what we want to be able to do with our Roblox game is really um, push people so that they feel like they are transported to Mars in their own home. We want to give them the feel and look of um, the Martian landscape. So we are, um, if you can, great, um, working on a game with Filament Games and with Roblox 
um, where you become a scientist and engineer on Mars using your avatar to place you into this new environment. Um, and with Roblox, if you've played, you, you create your own avatars and we we'll hope people will feel like they are there on Mars and not only by themselves, but also with their friends, also with their classmates. And the big challenge that we're going to have is to have them retrofit um, their own vehicle for Mars. Um, and there'll be a series of challenges where you redesign your vehicle based on what it is that you need to achieve. So in some cases, um, you might just need to roam around the Martian landscape and see if you can find hematite nodules, which are a sign that water had once been present. And so looking for what NASA calls these small blueberries um, on the surface and seeing if you can find them and equipping your vehicle to be able to do that research. Or um, we want you to feel like you're in the midst of a dust storm on Mars, which um, is not as windy as is in the Martian movies. Um, it's more like kind of a a rising fog, and when that happens, um, you no longer have solar energy. And so how do you design your rover so that you can um, move along the landscape, get your scientific research done, and even keep getting back to base, even if a dust storm comes along? And with Roblox, of course, the power is just that it's social. And so we're designing a social hub where either with your classmates in school or at home with friends, you can go to this area and learn from the other players about strategies that they've used and techniques that they've used, as well as gain more in-depth understanding of the Martian landscape, gain more in-depth understanding of some of the tools that you can use um, to engineer your vehicle so that it becomes stronger when you go back out there into the harsh landscape. And so through this, what we're really hoping is that everyone feels like this, that with their avatar, they feel transported that they're on the surface of Mars, and they can begin to imagine themselves as engineers, they begin to imagine themselves as scientists, and maybe, just maybe, they start to have that vision that one day um, they could be on Mars as well. So thank you, I'll hand it over. Awesome. Thank you so much, Christine. Next slide, please. Awesome, now we're gonna hear a little bit from Dan, who's with Filament Games, who's building cool. that experience and many others. Hi everybody, yep, so I'm Dan White, I'm the CEO at Filament Games. We are an educational game development shop, so we exclusively develop games for learning and positive impact. It means when I go to learning conferences, I'm really cool. When I go to game development conferences, I'm the nerd. You can advance the slide. <clears throat> so basically, as a learning game development studio, what we care a lot of, obviously like every game development studio, we care a lot about what happens to the player during the game. The thing that differentiates us is that we also care a lot about what happens to the player after the game. So how do we change them in some sort of ideally longitudinal, sticky way in terms of their expertise, their knowledge, their perspectives, their behaviors, things of that nature. So rewind about six years ago to the before times, we received a National Science Foundation grant to build a game about a topic that may be near and dear to some of you, and that is robotics. The game's called RoboCo. Looks like this, build robots to solve challenges. Uh, you can keep going. So in the game, you basically have a whole bunch of parts available to you, you build bespoke robots and you compete. And the whole idea behind this concept is we wanted to bring robotics to everybody. We wanted to make it as equitable and accessible as possible to widen the top of this proverbial fun, a funnel that leads to experiences like FIRST, to college degrees and careers around STEM. And the whole, the whole hope was that by making it digital, not only can we make it more accessible, we can also bring the cost way down, get it in the hands of many people as possible. Go ahead. So the, the big question then was, well, what does this actually look like when you take the culture and sort of the ethos and the methodology of an organization like FIRST, which we are officially partnered with, and combine it with a digital video game? Is it an eSport? You know, is it a robotics competition? We like to think it's kind of its own new genre that lives somewhere in between. So this was a competition that we did in November uh, with FIRST Global, where we had people from all over the world building robots. Of course, they made amazing things. Uh, and we learned a ton about what it looks like to have a digital competition. The problem was uh, that that version of the game is a single player experience. So through post-processing, we had to bring all the clips that the team sent us of their runs in the digital space together into sort of an ESPN sports style broadcast. But for each of those teams, the experience was kind of siloed. They were doing their best and then submitting it and then sort of finding out how they did against the other teams. Looks a lot different than 
what you see out there, right? That sort of energy of everybody being digitally co-located and sort of having this shared experience in a competitive format. So we got hooked up with Roblox and decided that it made a lot of sense to have this experience on the Roblox platform where it's synchronously multiplayer. So this is an early piece of concept art for this version of the game, which is called Roboco Sports League. And in Roboco Sports League, it's a very similar concept. You're still building bespoke robots with uh, the various different parts of robotics, gears and pistons and actuators and things of that nature. And then the difference is that you go into these multiplayer arenas with other players and you're competing in uh, arena style match play that looks quite similar to what you would see on the floor down below. Um, this is an actual screenshot of the game where we're at right now. Um, so you can see piecing together parts from blocks and other tools like that. Collaboration between us first and Roblox. And the long-term vision is, can we create this sort of evergreen platform for a digital competition space around robotics? Of course, since it's virtual, we can have our games look um, essentially whatever we want them to be. So this is an example concept of a castle siege game um, that we may do at some point. The next one is a, a concept of a very different type of game. So we want to have as much diversity as possible. We want to leverage the fact that we're digital to do some new and interesting things. We've been actually working with Kate P from FIRST, who designs the games for the physical competitions here. Uh, so it's really cool to be able to like have our game designers working with FIRST game designers and thinking about what should be similar, what should be different, how do we leverage this new digital medium, but at the same time sort of preserve a lot of what makes first competition so great and so interesting and so compelling. And the challenges are going to be this really nice mix of challenges for like one-on-one, -on -one, 6v6, exploring different game genres, uh, some things for people who are a little bit more entry level, some people, things for people who are a little bit more advanced. This is the core gameplay loop, which the astute among you will notice looks um, pretty similar to the engineering design process. So the whole idea is people come into this space, they pick a challenge or an arena they want to compete in, and then they design a robot to compete in that arena, and then enter this kind of iterative cycle where they're competing with their friends in that space, and then going back out and tweaking their robot based on what happens. And this is what it looks like. So there's this kind of big central hub area. Um, servers can have up to about 30 players on them at the same time. And you have your own build zone. Um, right now we have a pretty limited set of parts in the game, but we're going to be expanding that out over time. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so basically you would claim one of these build zones. Your friends would claim the other build zones. And then you go up into these match spaces. There's a soccer ball texture that's not working. <laughs> Um, this is like a prototype soccer arena match that we're working on right now. It's actually already been really cool to see how, min, how quickly it gets min-maxed. Some of the developers who've been working in the space have got some robots that are really hard to beat in the soccer game. So that's a big thing that we're going to have to be thinking about is balance, right? So with the physical games, you don't have that much time to prepare a robot and then compete with that robot, whereas these spaces will probably live on for longer periods of time. And, uh, people have more opportunities to play against them and maximize the best designs. So we're gonna have to try to figure out how to make it so that um, uh, the game continues to evolve even once people get really good at it. So that's Roboco Sports League. That's what we're making right now. Thanks. Awesome, thanks Dan. And now David with Project Lead the Way. Thank you so much. Um, first off, I love your mask. I want one of those. <laughs> you say PLTW on it, I really enjoy it. Um, thank you Rebecca so much uh, for bringing us here and for this, the partnership. I'm with Project Lead the Way. I'm, I'm, uh, my name is David Greer. I'm the Chief Programs Officer. And what that really means is I have the honor of supporting a world-class team of curriculum development specialists, professional development specialists, media and production team members, as well as our assessment team. Really all those team members that create the products of Project Lead the Way. And, and, and as you're, if you're familiar with Project Lead the Way or not, we're a, a big national not-for-profit organization that focuses on pre-K through 12 education around three major pathways, computer science, engineering, and biomedical science. And we really are looking at how we can bring project-based learning, relevance, career connections, all those components into the classroom that really excites and engages students. And, and we've really done that very well over the years in the classroom, <coughs> physically, hands-on. 
really reinforcing those transportable skills that we like to call 21st century skills, those collaboration, critical thinking, problem solving, ethical reasoning. How do we do that and do that well and at scale? And so we have focused over the years on, a, on a, I'm sorry, well, either way. We focused on really looking at it from the holistic uh, perspective. We look at pre-K and how we can engage students in rigorous, meaningful computer science experiences, engineering experiences, biomedical science experiences, and then we build upon that all the way up to 12th grade and then beyond. And so for us, we think it's really important for, for us to reach as many students as we can as quickly as we can. And we've done very well over the years that you saw in the previous slide. We're in all 50 states. We have millions of students in our programs. Um, we've trained over 80,000 teachers over the years. So we have a great reach, but we're nowhere close to reaching every student in America, and that's our goal. So how can we do that? How can we do that really well in the sense of bringing real value, currency, rigor, and most importantly, relevance to that, to that student experience? So what we have a chance to do now is partner with a great organization like Roblox to look at new and leading technologies to see how we can push ourselves to think differently, not just in the physical space, but in the virtual space. And we're approaching it kind of in two different ways. First off, we want to get this experience in the classroom, not just in the, in the sense of playing a game, but also the tools that you need to build those types of games. And so we've looked at how we can bring a, a, a tool like Roblox Studio, which is the, the editor used to build all these experiences that you see, um, that you saw earlier uh, today with the, my, my fellow panelists, into the classroom to train the teachers and but also train the students on how to use the tool effectively, be creative, look at it through a career lens as, as they put themselves in the position of a career professional that's building a game and designing a game and coding a game. How can they experience that and how can they can understand what the, cap the possibilities are for that? And then the, the second side of that is how do we build really high quality immersive educational experiences on the Roblox platform? We know these students are on this platform. That's where they want to be. And it seems like as educators, we like to pull students to where we want them to be and where we are, instead of trying to find out where they are and go to them and build these experiences in a way that they're excited, they're engaged, and they want to do it, right? They choose to do it. And so our approach is very similar to what you've heard from my fellow panelists. And, then, and as we look at the shared kind of vision that we all have, how do we get these high quality, meaningful experiences to as many students as we can? So we're doing it two ways. One is we've built out a game de design development module of curriculum that's given to all of our high school students. It could be engineering, biomedical science, computer science, it doesn't matter. And we've built it in a way that's really self-paced and supportive for, for our teachers in asynchronous professional development. And they can bring in that Roblox Studio into the classroom. They can explore with their students. They can design and build these experiences. They can put themselves in like the role of these professionals, if it's a graphic artist, if it's a coder, if it's a game designer, um, they understand those, those connection points and they can really build meaningful experiences. Next slide, please. So this is a quick video just to kind of show some of the assets that our students and our teachers are building. One of the assets is they, they're doing a physics game with a, a bowling simulation. So they had to build bowling pins and they wanted to put penguins in it. And then they have to design and sketch and, and create. So, in the whole process, they want to ideate. They want to sketch out ideas. They want to model those ideas. They want to build those models in these tools and editors. And they want ultimately want to create game experiences um, for themselves and, th and their peer students, and then also in the marketplace in Roblox. Next slide, please. At the, as kind of the culmination part of this, this module, there's an open-ended problem that our students get to address. And so everything that we do at PLTW, we call it APB, which is Activity, Projects, and Problem. And it took me a while to figure out what the B was when I first started there because it didn't make sense, but now it's the B in problem, just for everyone to, to know that. Um, and so this open-ended problem is a way that students can take everything they've learned over the, the curriculum experience and apply it to something that's meaningful for them. And this, this is an example of a real game that is, the, is the, like the end result of this module. Students are tasked to building an open world that, um, that students can go and interact and play, have game mechanics, uh, have physics, look at how you can use non-player player characters, NPCs, interact with the players, how you have different materials of different sizes, different values, uh, how you have resources that build other things. So this is just an example of an output of, of the, the student experience in the game design development module that we built. We think it's, the, it's a really important first step to get our students really excited and inter interested in continue their journey on Roblox in an educational, uh, in, a, in more of an educational way, instead of a game for fun as they were younger. 
kind of way. But most importantly, it's also a way to onboard our teachers to understand the power of tools like this and the ability that it gives our students to not only learn these complicated concepts, but also apply them in, in ways that they are excited about and have outcomes that they, they can play and share with their friends. So similar to, to what um, some panelists were talking about before, we think it's important to leverage Roblox's really a core assets, which is the social side of the platform. And so we are also creating a PLTW hub world. We, as I said before, we focus on three major pathways, engineering, computer science, biomedical science. We're focusing on one educational game to start with, but we wanna create many of these games and experiences for our students to be a part of. So we wanna create an environment they can come in and see the options, not just in the educational games, but other options. Like we really value career learning and career explorations. We wanna have rooms that they can go in and see examples of career professionals working in environments that they work in every day, especially environments that students could never have access to normally, right? We always say students can't be what they can't see. So but if you show them what's out there and what's possible, then it's our job to build them a pathway to achieve it if they so choose. So this is, we're starting at the first kind of hub world around our biomedical science pathway. And that's the first game we're, we're trying to explore with Roblox and really um, unlock a lot of its potential, not only for us in a classroom, but beyond our classroom. So this is a quick video of our very, very early stage build of our biomedical science game. And so hopefully this will load up, and if not, I will just talk through it. But what it really is we're trying to do is, again, take students where they can't normally go. So our focus is in biomedical science, and, and especially the human immune system. If, if you've ever taken a class like that, it's, and I've learned more and more every day I've been in part of this project, it is a fascinating, complicated system. And to really truly understand it, it's very difficult, but, but we're trying to build these experiences where students can go in to the human body and go into these environments and become these cells and understand how these cells actually operate and what they do, but most importantly, how they operate with other cells and interact with other cells where no one cell can, can fight a bacteria infection or a virus infection alone. They have to work together. So we're building this, this ecosystem in this environment where students can come in by themselves or in teams of four to work through and combat these different infections around the body. There's, there's a, a map with different parts of the infection that are there. You can, you can become a neutrophil, which is a really interesting cell that kind of goes around and, and uh, kind of um, tags different, different other uh, bacteria or virus cells for other uh, uh, immune system cells to, to attack. There's the macrophage, which is really interesting. It kind of vomits out this, this toxic chemicals all around it and just kills everything. So it's, you have to be very careful because it could hurt healthy cells and the virus and the bacteria. Um, there's killer T cells. There's all these different cells that have great names, right? But who knows what they really do? So the idea for this is how do you create a, an environment in, a, in a, a game that students can go into and play and learn? There's no prior knowledge needed to play this game. You can come in without knowing anything about the human system and you just play and you experiment and you learn and you start seeing how these cells have different capabilities that can combat different types of bacteria or virus. It works in concert with this other type of cell. You need to jump from this cell to another cell to really accomplish your goal. You need to work with a teammate to work together to attack a certain part of the body or to defend it so that the other side's not compromised. We have professional um, uh, uh, care professionals that are there like mentoring you along the way and helping give you, you tips and hints and, and, and help make sure you're attacking and, and defending the right way. So the idea for all of this is how do we make this not only rigorous and map to very extensive and uh, learning objectives, and this is just a few of the learning objectives we're mapping to, but how do you make it fun? How do you find the fun? And how do you make it replayable so that the students choose to go back and keep playing it and learning more and getting deeper understandings of, of how this system works? But then most importantly, which I think we'll talk about here in a second, is how do you measure that? How do you assess that? How do you know these students are demonstrating that they're understanding the learning objectives and they're, they're mastering these different concepts? So really applying not only what I call stealth learning, which is the concept of, hey, I'm playing this game and I'm learning something, I just don't realize I'm learning something, to stealth assessment. How do you assess these things as they're happening so that you can really pull out those moments in time and this experience that can show and demonstrate these students are getting it or they're not and we need to refocus on other areas. So it's something I'm really excited about. Um, Rebecca and team has been fantastic. Um, this is targeted to be released in the fall. Um, but we're building as, as we're going, as, as you see, uh, unfortunately you can see the video, but really early stage gray box build. We're proving the game mechanics, we're proving out the, the game loop, and we're optimizing it so that it has meaning 
and that the collaboration is really a key component of how you accomplish the missions. So with that said, I think that was longer than seven minutes, I apologize, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, that's all I have. Awesome, thank you, David. So I wanna open it up to you guys in just two minutes. I'm gonna ask these guys to do a quick lightning round. You already touched on why Roblox a little bit, but if you don't mind just double clicking on, you know, why is it worth it for students and for educators to come up the learning curve and deal with the friction involved in deploying an experience like this during class where you've gotta get everyone's accounts registered and you need to make sure that it's compatible with your school's policies. It's kind of a headache. What's the promise of these experiences that you feel like really taps into something that our, our educators and students don't have right now? I think I just, I kind of said it a little bit on mine, and I, maybe I jumped the gun on this question, but um, I think the ability to, to take students where they could never go on their own or in the physical world is something that's really um, powerful. I also think that, you know, as we, as we look at um, how we engage our students um, through collaboration, through critical thinking, through problem solving, using technology that's really available in person is one thing, like robotics. You're building all these robots and you're working together, you're solving these problems, you're doing all these, you're having all these great transportable skills that are being developed that you realize that are not, right? How can you, how can you mimic that in a real meaningful way virtually? And I think platforms like Roblox is re are really gonna help us not only learn how to do that well, but kind of demonstrate and prove out that it's, you're having similar outcomes as you would um, in, in the physical world. So I think that's really important as well as you look at um, how we can, can leverage technologies like this and, and uh, platforms like Roblox to really bring, um, kind of the make the invisible visible in some ways, like when you're talking about the immune system, uh, but also uh, bring those experiences that are maybe have been limited to a few that have the, the, the access to that type of equipment or that robot or whatever uh, and bring that to the many and have them, many more students uh, experience a, a, a much more meaningful and just as valuable experience as they would have in the physical world. Yeah, there is a, a dearth of multiplayer educational video games. And a big part of the reason for that is it's really expensive to make multiplayer. And platforms like Roblox basically say, well, that part comes for free. Now you just have to build the educational experience on top of that, which is amazing. And so I guess then the next logical question is like, well, why should I care about multiplayer? And the cool thing about multiplayer in any of these game experiences is that there are so many critical future-facing skills that come along again for free for the ride when you have students collaborating with each other in these interesting problem spaces. So um, I just lo I love the idea that um, in addition to interacting with the content of each of these spaces, we get all these 21st century skills, the future-facing skills that are going to be so important for students to master in order to stay relevant in a world and a, and a workforce that's increasingly giving way to automation, machine learning, and things of that nature. So these like uniquely human skills that are recruited in the process of collaboration with other students is, is just incredible. The other thing that's really cool about um, building games on the Roblox platform is that the game that you release is this sort of living, breathing, evolving entity, right? So like across the last 16 years, Filament has created 200 some odd games. And most of those are kind of fire and forget experiences. We get a set of learning objectives, we design gameplay mechanics, teach those learning objectives, we build out a game, we test it, and then we put it out there and people play it, and that's, that's that. Um, and ideally, they play it for a really long time, but the game is static at that point. It's kind of, it's kind of like, a, a, you know, like a mammoth frozen in a block of ice. It's never really gonna change after that point. Whereas with Roblox, we have this opportunity to have this kind of dialogue with our player community, right? And that means with you, that means with educators, it means with students, we can see how you're using the game, we can talk to you about how you're using the game, and then we can evolve the game in response to that to make it a sharper tool. Um, and I just think that's an incredibly exciting thing about the platform. I'll echo everything all of you just said, but I'll, um, rather than doing that, I'll build on it and say that the other key, I think, is emotional engagement. Um, for so long, we've thought of kind of reasoning and emotion as being separate from one another, but in neuroscience now, we know that if the section of your brain that, that affects your ability to kind of have deep emotions gets Im impacted, um, it actually impacts your ability to make decisions. Most of our decision-making, most of what drives us are our emotions. 
And so when it comes to powerful learning experiences, those are the ones that really excite our emotions. And I think about what happens here with, with FIRST and the championship, you all get so emotionally invested in what you're creating. And that's so hard to achieve in the classroom. And I think the powerful thing with, with Roblox is um, because you have this avatar in Penny View Play, um, you know how attached you get to your avatar. Um, mine currently has a very fancy hat on right now because um, I love wearing hats. And so um, you get attached to your avatar. You get attached to your social group that's in this game with you. And now you've got this great emotional rush to begin that compels you to play. So that when you face a challenge where in a traditional classroom you might want to um, kind of, I don't know, it's kind of slump down in your seat and not pay attention and say, this is too much work, I don't feel like doing it. Because you're emotionally invested, you're going to push through that challenge, even when it feels difficult. And then when you push through that challenge, that's when the greatest learning happens. So with Roblox, because of your avatar, because it's multiplayer, um, because we can place you in these settings, it's a high initial interest that enables you to push through that challenge and to get to that aha moment at the end that makes you feel better about who you are as a learner, that deepens your learning, and I think compels you to want to learn more. And to bring that into a classroom, I think, is really powerful, and Roblox is one of the few ways that could happen. Totally agree, and David touched on this too, but one of the things that Roblox is working on is making available more of our assessment expertise and embedded assessment, not the scary kind of high stakes assessment, just being able to reflect on how has the student progressed through an experience and what would be appropriate next and how do we level up or ratchet down the level of difficulty in there so that it's actually engaging and appropriate all the time. So with that, don't wanna have us drone on and on. Thank you so much to everyone on the panel, but wanna open it up to all of you guys to just ask questions. Yeah, go ahead. No worries. Yeah, absolutely, rightfully so, and I know that graceful professionalism is a key tenant here at first, and certainly Roblox, from the earliest days of our founder Dave's vision, has been all about civility and safety. Now, that doesn't mean that it's perfect, of course. You always have bad actors when you have huge communities, and we have countless time and, and resources dedicated towards safety and moderation. It's an ongoing battle and something we're always trying to improve, but on the education side, all of these experiences as an educator, you'll create a private server, which is totally free to do on Roblox. So I'll start on the security side and the talking with people in your school and making sure that you know it's a civil environment. So first, you're limited to just your class. So you'll invite in, or if you were partnering with another class, I suppose you could do that too, but your school, and you're only able to interact with other folks who you as an educator have ruled into your experience, so your students or your fellow teacher students, et cetera. Um, next, you can decide if you want to have chat on or not, so it's up to you. All of Roblox's chat for these experiences will be filtered, so there's no way to say naughty words or share numbers or share personal information or anything like that. It's disabled from the get-go technologically. And then, of course, every experience that's happening on Roblox is always moderated as well. So let's say there was a case where students were in the experience at home and maybe a, a classroom teacher wasn't in the loop and bullying or something like that was happening. Roblox allows different players to, just like at, in the first community where all of you kind of band together to say, hey, this person's doing a great job supporting their team, or maybe we can support this individual better in this way. Same thing on Roblox, you can report someone for bad behavior, and in a lot of these experiences, developers choose to recognize folks for being a great team player, great behavior. So we'll try and build in all of those kinds of peer-to-peer -peer mechanisms as well. And then on the data side, you know, this is something that we'd love educators' feedback on and students' feedback on right now. Roblox already collects next to nothing in terms of your PII. You can put in your email and you can put in your date of birth for account recovery and that's it. You can't use your name and your username. We're moving towards password lists, but right now we do have the idea of a permanent account, right? You have your avatar, it goes with you across experiences and you obviously have a data trail of your student work that's left behind of what you do in those experiences. 
we can absolutely continue that on the education front so that you could have a track record of interacting with 10 of these engineering experiences. And for those of you, I don't know, maybe who are getting ready to apply for an internship or something, you could show folks, here are the projects I built in Roblox Studio, or here are the engineering design challenges that I overcame on the Roblox platform, and share that out. So we can offer that kind of persistence. Obviously, we need to store the data for some period in order to allow you to do that, but that's just your data of gameplay, what you did in an experience or in studio. We alternatively can also set it up so that you have temporary accounts where nothing's stored. So you could just take a screenshot at the end and share that with your teacher, for example, locally on your computer. So we're still listening and trying to learn about what do, what do folks like you all want? If you were gonna have this in class, what's important to you as students, as educators, as district administrators? But that's how we're thinking about it right now. Sorry for the long answer. Yeah. Yeah, so overall, most people are surprised to know about, the majority of Roblox users now, over 50% are over age 13, so it's definitely a demographic that as folks are growing up, they're bringing Roblox with them. A number of these experiences are targeted at high school, specifically Project Lead the Ways and, and Filament's first experience are both targeted at the high school level. So I, I hope and expect that they'll do really well, but Roblox's frontier in education is still very new, so I can't say to you, oh, we've already seen you know 50 examples at the high school level, but the platform itself is really toe-to-toe -to -toe with any other game development engine. So Roblox Studio versus Unity versus Unreal, I mean, anything those engines can power, so can Roblox. So I think over time, you'll see more experiences that lean into the incredible physics engine, like the first and filament experience to the materials and the ability to understand properties of materials like the Mission to Mars experience. And hopefully that will prove really rich and compelling for high school students as well. Yeah. I have a, I have a quick answer oh, sorry, to that. Sorry. It's yeah, more ahead, funny than anything else. I had the same question when we first started this project, right? I, I had really, my bias was to Roblox. My kids played Roblox as they were growing up, younger ages. And one day I was meeting with Rebecca in my office at home and my daughter walks by who's 17 and heard me talking about Roblox. And afterwards she's like, what were you talking about? And I told her, she's like, really? Can I be like a, a play tester for that? I was like, you still play Roblox? She's like, oh yeah, I play it all the time. I was like, I'm, I'm gonna tell my friends, they're gonna be really excited about this, right? So I'm like, okay, well maybe there is something there. It's a great question. I think it's a question we're gonna test. We're targeting ninth grade and above. Um, and we're, but we're looking at this rigorous curriculum experience that can be used in a lot of places, right? The on-ramps could be everywhere. It could be outside the classroom for someone that's never seen an immune system work to wrapped around curriculum in the classroom with an experience in a really rigid or really structured biology or biomedical science curriculum. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I should have said at the outset, all of these experiences are free and using Roblox is free and it will remain that way. So you could absolutely access any of these experiences just in the learn and explore sort on Roblox the way you can access any other experience now on the platform, whether you're at home, whether you're in school. We're still working on becoming more compatible as a platform with schools filtering software and, and Wi-Fi settings and network controls so that we're able to whitelist things that are appropriate for in-school use and still allow schools to restrict access to things that might be too distracting for having available during the school day. So we still have work to do there, but all of these experiences are gonna be totally available to the entire community. Yeah, so right now we're looking toward the end of this year. 
Um, and then, as I mentioned before, sort of the, the launch of a Roblox experience is in some ways like the beginning as opposed to the end. So we'll be continuing to iterate on it after that launch, uh, again, in dialogue with the, the player community, which will hopefully include a whole bunch of people from this community. And um, yeah, I'm really, really particularly interested in uh, the extent to which people are able to use it to iterate on new ideas, you know, that they then maybe take back into the pit to inform the things that they build physically. Um, so like, uh, you know, we're talking with Kate, for example, about well, what would it look like if we had kind of an homage level for a particular season? And we said, okay, we're gonna structure this particular arena to be similar to how the arena is actually set up and people can sort of practice some things digitally, understanding that the physics is in a one-to-one -one simulation of reality. And of course the fidelity in terms of the parts um, that are available to players is, is different. Uh, but still to be able to walk through some of the um, conceptualization of different approaches to tackling those challenges, I think that'd be super cool. So um, yes, the answer is we, I don't know exactly, uh, we don't yet know exactly when we'll be making it available to the public, but it will be available to first teams before it's available to the public. Um, so it'll be sooner uh, versus later. And, um, and, and we're hoping, yeah, bring it online probably later this year. Yeah, that's a great question. So that's where the assessment angle comes in. And I think all of our wants is to be able to recognize when students demonstrate mastery of something, whether that confers into credit in a class where you've done an assignment, whether that confers into credit for a whole course or credit in a job marketplace, right, where you might be thinking about leveraging something in a portfolio for an internship or career opportunity. Certainly what all of us are working towards and thinking about, it's obviously hard to embed assessment in these things in a way that's authentic and reliable, but that's what all of our teams are striving for. Yeah. Oh, okay, great. In, in the first Roblox project, how did they move the robots? How did they move the robots? Yeah, virtual, so virtual RC controllers. So basically you, every, t every motor uh, gets wired up to um, key binding in whatever way you want to, it's totally customizable. Yeah. Exactly, yep. Yep, or whatever keys you want, really. Yeah, yep. Is there every, um, you can have as many controllers as you want, you can have as many motors as you want. You do get docked points for, uh, so their time and budget are two of the scoring criterion. And if you add a whole bunch of motors uh, to your robot, it will get very expensive very quickly. So um, we've seen, I mean, we, we, we saw um, solutions all across the, the board. I think the, URL for that is fgrc21 dot something. <laughs> but we've got YouTube and Twitch um, recordings of all of the uh, qualifiers, the playoffs and the semifinals, um, which were, of course, a lot of work to put together because, as I mentioned, it was all post-processing, whereas uh, we'd like to do YouTube and Twitch broadcasts of the Roblox competitions as well, which will be just a matter of setting up virtual cameras in the space and, re and recording the live event. So that'll be uh, quite a bit easier from, a, from an AV perspective. But yeah, uh, we also do have, um, in the PC version of the experience, we are close to having automation online. So we're hoping to have the competitions begin with an automated section, just like you do here. Uh, and then at some point, we'd like to bring that functionality and parity over to the Roblox version as well. How will they do the automation? Yeah, so um, <clears throat> right now you would pull up, uh, you basically write your script and then you can import that script directly into the game. Um, at some point we would like to also, we were originally thinking uh, that we would start with visual scripting, but we realized we would sort of have to remake Scratch from scratch <laughs> inside of the Unity game engine, which was a pretty significant undertaking. So we ended up just uh, going with the, you know, plucking the lower hanging fruit and saying, yeah, you'll write code the same way that you would write code for anything else and you just import that script into the game. Um, it's maybe a little bit different with Roblox because Roblox is also a scripting engine as well in the Lua um, scripting language. And so we may be able to short, find a, um, a shorter path to that functionality by leveraging the existing 
functionality in the engine, but that's still TBD. Mm -hmm. Cool. Any final question? Otherwise, definitely welcome folks to come to talk to any of us. Yeah. Yeah, one last question. Um, the question is on addiction. So imagine like a kid starts loving their food, right? Uh, apart from that, there are other, other subjects also they have to study. So how you guys prevent this kind of addiction? I see that same thing with uh, uh, what uh, so Minecraft. Yeah, I'll turn it over to these guys for in-game specifics, but certainly we don't want anyone to become addicted to any experience, even a good thing. We recognize people need to do all sorts of other things in their life to have a really rich and fulfilling quality of life. As a parent or as an educator, there are a lot of controls available to you. If you go into the parental controls section on Roblox right now where you can set restriction, obviously also on a device you can restrict um, screen time and access. So we definitely encourage you to use those right now. And then in each of our experiences, it's up to our developers, one, to comply with Roblox's community guidelines in terms of service and everything, which have certain specifications. You can't have you know, loot boxes or a range of, of mechanics that are not allowed. But um, otherwise, it's up to all of these guys to think about that throughout their development process and make sure that they're encouraging really healthy habits of engagement. Yeah. Uh, do you guys have any kind of option that within the day, only certain hours they can do it and the parent can control like, okay, one hour, of course, you have the flexibility, what hour you choose, but only one hour. Then, uh, so you can, you can do that right now for Roblox as an application but not within experiences yet. I don't know if that will change over time, but right now we don't, we don't know exactly how to implement that or haven't implemented that on the education front. Yeah, it's a great question because obviously one of our objectives as a design team is to design the most engaging experience possible because we want to be pulling people into these educational spaces and we want them to stick around for a little while. Um, honestly, I, I think it's so difficult for us as an educational game development studio to compete with commercial, commercial entertainment experiences that we often don't <laughs> worry about addiction because in some ways that is uh, um, uh, a, a goal that would probably not be possible for us to achieve even if we wanted to. But to set your mind at ease at some, I can say that um, from a design perspective, the most addictive games are usually engineered to be addictive, right? The design team is sitting down, they're saying, whether it's because of our monetization model or something else, we want to keep these players in this space as long as absolutely possible. And we'll, so we're design our game mechanics in order to elicit the behavior that we want, right? So as in our case, our, our design objective is not to keep the player there as long as possible. Our design objective is to give them the conceptual understandings uh, that we'd like to impart. And so those don't often involve addictive, well, those never involve addictive mechanics. Awesome. I think we need to wrap, but thank you all so much. And please find any of us if you have feedback or ideas. Thank you. Thank you.